We are going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. And I'm calling this teaching Faith, Courage, and Love. Faith, Courage, and Love. Let's stand up as I read our verses over us today. As we tell the Lord, our hearts are ready for the implanted word. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm going to read 23 through 27, just so you get kind of an idea of what's going on. But we're really going to focus on verse 23. We read, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt for he looked to the reward by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured or persevered as seeing him who is invisible father thank you again that you have chosen to deliver to us your word this morning Thank you, Jesus, that you made it clear that it is the Holy Spirit who is the teacher and the revealer of truth. Holy Spirit, come and teach us. Find the soil of our hearts ready for the implanted word of God. Speak to our hearts in a way in which we know it is you who are speaking. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and everyone says. Amen. You may be seated. Interesting, and I take note that this is our regular progression through the entirety of the Bible. But did you notice how it just happened to land on a section where we have a scripture speaking about a mom and her son on Mother's Day? <laughs> I'll just have you know I planned that out perfectly. No, I, I didn't at all. I did it all. That's the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in my eyes. I heard the story about two children who had gone shopping for their mom on Mother's Day. The four-year-old and the six-year-old presented their mom with a small house plant and a card which they had made themselves. Dad had taken them shopping. The gift had been purchased with their own money. And so naturally, mom was absolutely thrilled. The older of the two began telling the story of how the gift had been picked out saying that the house plant had not been their first choice. But the dad had changed their minds. And so the six-year-old then added, Mom, there was a bouquet at the flower shop that we really wanted to get you. It was very pretty, but it cost too much money. But it even had a ribbon on it that said, Rest in peace. <laughs> And we thought of you because you're always asking for a little peace so you can get some rest. <laughs> Let me take us back to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 for the definition of faith. Because we're in the faith chapter. Here's what we're given. Let me just say this. Hebrews chapter 11 we are given illustrations of faith. We find out in this chapter what faith is. We find out what it means to us. And we find out how to put our faith to work in our own daily living. So here's what it says. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. You can take a look in your Bibles. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Can I run that through again? <laughs> Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So faith, we find out right away, operates in two circles. Faith operates, first of all, in relationship to the future. Faith looks to the future. That's things hoped for. And secondly, 
Faith operates in relation to the invisible. Faith looks forward and faith sees the invisible. I think Wednesday night or Saturday, uh, whenever, <laughs> we were having a little discussion about, do anybody remember the fellow that Jesus healed from blindness? He was a young man and his mom and dad were there with him. And then uh, all comes along the religious leaders and they're like all poking and prodding. Now, what did Jesus say? And, and how did he heal you? What exactly did he do? You know, they're just... Uh, just interrogating this uh, kid, you know. Uh, finally, the kid, and it, it appears the way the account reads, out of total frustration, he goes, look, I don't know how he did it. All I can tell you is that I was blind and now I can see. That's how faith operates, just in that same manner. Here's an early church father, Augustine, and here's what he had to say about faith. You ready? Faith is to believe what we do not see and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. Wow, that's really awesome, isn't it? All right, so how important is faith? How important is faith? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. You can take a look at that. It tells us, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. You would think it might say, without faith, it's not likely. <laughs> or without faith, well, who knows if you do or not. But look what it says. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. That's God. For he who comes to God must believe two things, that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So as we work through this chapter, we are working on a very, very all-important subject. The subject is faith, your faith, and my faith. In fact, <coughs> I think it is so important that perhaps instead of saying to each other, uh, good morning, how are you today? Maybe we should trade that out. Maybe we should say to each other, how's your faith doing today? because it's all important. Now, from our verses today, I want you to key in on the truth that faith brings hope and faith changes behavior. Because the folks we're looking at today have hope and behavior that is all triggered based on faith. If you have faith, you'll look different than the rest of the culture. If you have faith and put your faith in God, you'll say things differently. You'll act differently. You'll have a, a different appearance. Today we are dealing with the life of Moses and his parents. And today we are primarily looking at his mom and dad's act of faith. We look at Moses and we know the terrific story, don't we? But it all started with mom and dad as it always does. So this week we're talking about mom and dad's faith. Next week we'll be talking about three additional acts of faith by a grown-up Moses. These verses cover a period of time of about 80 years. But let's not look at those 80 years. Let's just look at the first three months of those 80 years. And we have the very first act of faith. And it is by the parents of Moses. Moses. And the crisis that they faced was life and death. This is no small matter of a crisis. I bet you we have some parents here this morning that have faced some crisis with their kids. Mom, would you raise your hand? I know you've had crisis. With you. <laughs> Yet on account of her prayers, here I stand. So we are not speaking of some small matter, and yet in faith they found a way to navigate through a monumental parental uh, crisis in a very hostile culture. It seems like we're kind of there today, doesn't it? Now here today, we know that a lot of you have heard all about Moses, you know about Moses, you're familiar with the book of Exodus, you, you just... 
you know him thoroughly. I want you to forget all about all that. Just blank it out of your mind for a moment. Because as we start out here, this is at the very beginning. And the account is about a mom and a dad and a brand new baby. That's the whole of the story. A mom and a dad and a brand new baby. I heard a couple of funny expressions by a mother who said, see if you can relate. Uh, you're a parent when it takes longer to get everyone in the car than it takes to make the trip. <laughs> is that true? It is. <laughs> How about this one? I really like this one. Being a parent means knowing how to unwrap a Snickers bar without making a noise. <laughs> but kids have radar for such things, don't they? So let's talk about faith, the faith of uh, Moses' parents. At the time that Moses was born, uh, there was a uh, population explosion going on in Egypt. In Egypt, with this population explosion happening, the Pharaoh looked at all these Hebrew kids multiplying, and he got fearful. And so the king puts out this uh, decree. And in the decree, the Pharaoh says, uh, his fear was they would be outnumbered, and eventually a revolt would happen, and uh, that wouldn't be good for Egypt. So the decree said that all male babies must be at their birth tossed into the Nile. We read in Exodus 1.22, The Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every Hebrew son who is born, you are to cast into the Nile, and every daughter you are to keep alive. And since this order was directly from the Pharaoh, it carried with it the understanding that if you did not obey the order, then you too would be put to death. So it would mean the death of the parents as well. And so Moses' parents had two choices. Choice number one, kill your son at birth. Choice number two, try and possibly save your son at the risk of all of your lives. There was no middle ground. Look again at verse 23 of Hebrews 11. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because... Now you know every time I see the word because in the scriptures, I like it. Because the word because is a reason word. So why did they do what they did? Because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. In here are wonderful lessons and understandings. Here's the first. The kind of love and courage that faith will instill in your life. Acts of love and courage in the life of the believer come from faith and that our faith is a reasoning faith in other words faith and reason get along together just fine and dandy okay mom and dad hid baby Moses for three months the verse says because they saw he was a beautiful child you know how I translate that that's love right they love the child and the love that they had for the child was greater than the order to kill the child. Secondly, and they were not afraid of the king's command. That's courage in the face of their own possible deaths. Can you imagine what a rough three months that must have been? Trying to, a sleepless nights. Hey, I'll bet. Anybody here have a baby that cried the first three months? Just cry, cry, cry. And all you did was cry, cry, cry with them. <laughs> uh, sleepless nights trying to keep that baby undetected while thinking through the whole thing. We all could be dead with what we're trying to do. 
But they looked at the baby and they gushed over that beautiful baby boy. Moms, you got some beautiful baby boys? Mom, you can raise your hand again. <laughs> Even though I know you love Mick better than me, but it's another story. We don't care. Here's what their thinking was. We don't care what order or law is out there. We are not going to kill this baby, not for nothing, not even for our own well-being. We are not even going to kill this baby if it makes our life easier. We are not even going to kill this baby if it makes things better for us. Are you with me? Which someone could argue and should argue is the story behind abortion today. God help us for the judgment I thoroughly expect to come. Since 1973, there have been 55 million abortions. I don't know who could not look at that number and say there's something wrong in the American culture. Our faith will not allow us to give in to fear. I know you've heard this before, but as a believer, we need to ingest this truth. Here it is. Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered, and no one was there. That's what faith does. It instills courage with, within the believer. What I see that we are being shown here is that this act of courage... Can I get some water? <coughs> this act of courage regarding Pharaoh's law and the act of overriding love for their son comes from faith. I hope we all get excited as we look at this, just this one verse and the prospect of putting our faith to work, knowing it will bring us courage and love in a growing dark and cold world. You also recognize that there's a number of times in the scriptures where even the person who gets touched or healed or whatever good thing happens to them back from the dead, receive their sight, that in many of the cases in the gospel, it's not the faith of the person. How many of you know this? Time and time again, it's the mom. <laughs> it's the dad. It's their faith. Because you'll see that this person was you know, had this problem or that problem or whatever it was. And it says, Jesus seeing their faith. Not the sick person's. Seeing their, the person that brought them. Have faith. Stir up some faith in your heart, even at this moment. I know there's moms and dads here praying for their sons and daughters. Huh? Have some faith right now. Bring that child to Jesus. Just... Even, here he is, Lord. Don't you think they did that when they brought a sick child to Jesus? Jesus, here he is. Here she is. Putting all the faith that they had in that. Thank you, my brother. Give me one second. You see, faith gives us wings of love and the courage to fly. Faith frees us to dare to take risks to put ourselves out there. It is the believing that we are already citizens of heaven. What do I care what the world thinks? I know what happens next. I'm going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as far as this world is concerned, the very worst thing that could happen to me only leads to the very best thing that is going to happen to me, namely being face to face with Jesus. It is freeing. It is freeing to know that God will supply all our needs. The person of faith doesn't have to panic. God's going to provide. He said he would. He said he takes care of the sparrows and he takes care of the valleys. And aren't you worth more to him than that? Faith 
that his great love for us promises that he will never leave us and never forsake us. That's God's promise to you by faith. Put your faith in these things and his promises and you will leave with an attitude of freeing risk taking. What causes a missionary to go someplace where the United States government says, uh, we do not authorize any travel in this state or in this country or in this place. And yet in they go. Every uh, month, uh, part of uh, the tithe that you give goes to Samaritan's Purse. They're usually the first ones in there with relief and water and prayer and the scriptures. They go where no one will ever go. God bless them. Why? Because they have this freeing faith. Put your faith there. Look, here's, let me give you a couple of risks then. Maybe your risks are not as great as Moses' mom and dad. Maybe your risk today is trusting your son or your daughter to dad's care. I'm talking about your father in heaven. I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust my son or my daughter to dad's care. Maybe it's moms that are here today and are going to make the choice to stand strong against the whims of this ever-changing culture, which more and more rejects God and his word. Instead, you're going to cling all the more tightly to the wisdom of God's word and the beauty of applying the truth from God's word to your own lives. It's been said, I absolutely believe it, any dead fish can float downstream. It takes a live fish to swim against the current. What we see here is Moses' mom and dad trying to raise a family in a hostile environment. That's where we can relate. That's where you can stand up, moms and dads and, and grandmas and grandparents, Give it to your kids over and over. God is creator. We're going to pray, kids, in and out of church and in and out of school. Sweetheart, we bring praises to God. He's coming back again. Jesus died for our sins. Oh, how he loves us and rose again on the third day. His word is so firm, it'll never pass away. Grandmoms, get in your little grandkids' face and say, Jesus is your best friend. Jesus is your best friend. He'll never leave you and never forsake you. I was at Teen Challenge this last Thursday. And there were five graduations. And they asked me to come and speak. And I was so blessed. Every time I go there, I, I feel like a robber because I steal away all the blessings. <laughs> I'm the one who gets filled, and I, I, you know, I sit down in a chair, and I just feel like I'm going to come off the top of it. I, ginger. <laughs> I was so happy. And I watched these five uh, young men between the ages of, I don't know, look, one looked like he was pretty young, so it was maybe like 18 to about 35 or 36. I was thinking to myself as I was listening to them, what things did they have in common? What was the common thread that ran through their testimonies? And I came out with a couple of them. See, as I listen to their testimonies, the first thing that happens is it just curls your hair. You're just like, you did what? You lived where? You, you did what? And you're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe uh, what's going on here. Drugs and alcohol are, are absolute destroyers of life. Who, how many know that? You, you want a fast ticket to a destroyed life. There it is. And the first part of their testimonies, just curl your hair. But the second part of their testimonies just fills your heart. And it almost seems without question, each one of them are talking about this, uh, this discovery. This kind of like, I thought things were like this, but guess what? They're not. They're like this. And there's something about living apart from God that does make you blind. That does 
not enable you to see with eyes of faith. But each one of these, here's how I lived and here's what I didn't believe. There was a guy that somehow he ended up in Teen Challenge and he knew absolutely nothing about God. No God in his background, no God in his childhood. He said, I don't even know how I ended up here. <laughs> I do. But he says, I ended up here and uh, I have a girlfriend and she's pregnant. I mean, she, she just had her baby. And, uh, and, and you're just like listening to him. And he knows nothing. I mean, nothing. So there's no Christian ease in him. You know, Christian ease, thou shalt. And there's none of that. But the words that came out of his mouth, things like, I found out that Jesus is real. I found out that he loves me. And, and now I, I love him. And he's like, I hope I'm making sense because this is all so new to me. Uh, just, you know, your heart is just pounding in your chest like, Lord, grab that kid and hold him tightly and bring him in. He goes, so I've got this whole future ahead of me. God is good. <laughs> Nehemiah 8.10 says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And listen to me, God will give each person everything they need in order to believe in him. Nobody's going to get shorted. Every single person at one point or another, whether they're a small kid or an adult on their deathbed, God will tap on everybody's shoulder because in the book of James it says God has given to everyone a measure of faith. And so with that measure of faith, God knocks at the doors of hearts to see who will respond to him, to see who will look his way, and then he has blessings for them. Let me end with a, a special poem. It really is an illustration of faith. You remember earlier on I gave you the quote, faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. You ready? Here it is. Here's the story. This, it's a Mother's Day story. This is the story of two babies in a mother's womb. This is a true story. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you'll be able to apply it. Watch this. Uh, two babies in a mother's womb. One baby asked the other baby, Do you believe in life after delivery? <laughs> the other baby replied, Why, of course, there has to be something after delivery. Maybe we are here to prepare ourselves for what we will be later. Nonsense, said the first. There is no life after delivery. What kind of life would that be anyway? The second one said, I don't know, but I believe there will be more light there than there is here. Maybe we will even walk with our legs and eat with our mouths. Maybe we will have other senses that we cannot now understand. The first replied, that's absurd. Walking is impossible. And eating with our mouths? That's ridiculous. The umbilical cord that supplies nutrition and everything we need is far too short. So life after delivery must be logically excluded. The second baby insisted. Well, I think there is something. And maybe it's different than it is here. Maybe we won't need this physical cord anymore. The first replied, nonsense. And moreover, even if there is life after delivery, then why has no one come back from there? <laughs> delivery is the end of life. And in the after delivery, there is nothing but darkness and silence and oblivion. It takes us nowhere. Well, I don't know about that, said the second. But certainly, we will meet mother, and she will take care of us. The first replied, mother? 
You actually believe in a mother? That's laughable. If mother exists, where is she now? The second baby said, I believe she is all around us. We are surrounded by her. We are of her. It is in her that we live. Without her, our world would not and could not exist. The first said, well, I don't see her, so it's only logical that she doesn't exist. To which the second replied, sometimes when you're very quiet and you focus and you really listen, you can perceive her presence and you can hear her loving voice calling down from above. Acts chapter 17, verse 28, Paul the Apostle wrote, For in God we live and move and exist. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Faith brings courage and it brings love to operate in a totally different way than perhaps you've ever experienced. Or perhaps even now you get a taste of this that the courage that God has for you and the love that you have for, that he has for you in your life is dependent upon your faith and your seeking him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this morning. It's been a full morning, Lord. We've had a, a lot going on in this service today. And I thank you for all of it. Bless all the special music and the girls that were up here, Lord God. They did a beautiful job. And now, Father, I commend all of our hearts to you. Lord, don't let the word that we heard today be taken away. Instead, help us even this day to jaw on these things, to meditate on these things, that faith brings courage and faith brings love, and it is through faith that we know you and can please you. Thank you, Father, for this morning. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody says, Amen. let's all stand up.